Hey, folks, welcome, welcome. So, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Michaela, for the nice introduction. And uh, today, actually, we are going to talk about a document that uh, we have actually put up for public comments, so namely 800-207-A, uh, that uh, actually underlies the principles, you know, in terms of uh, uh, different uh, levels of uh, policies and uh, how to make it happen, how to realize a zero trust architecture, especially for cloud native applications. Yeah, exactly. The the real goal here, and we'll, why don't you go on to the next slide and we can talk mm -hmm. about the, you know, we, no, we'll, we'll get into it in a minute, but, you know, we really wanted to give some some kind of tangible definition to, to zero trust in this, and so we'll go over that in just a second, but you know, our real goal was to kind of make it something that we can actually wrap our hands around. Right. So specifically what we are going to be briefly reviewing the application scenario as of now, and uh, our previous presenter, Bates, has given a very good idea of yep. how the modern application looks like in terms of where it is accessed, where the so-called perimeter has disappeared, and uh, how it is uh, ubiquitous distribution is there in terms of multiple clouds and multiple uh, on-premises. On uh, so that we, so we will go through that background very briefly. So now that we have got a good idea. And then in this particular situation, what type of policy framework is very appropriate? Driven purely by the zero trust principles and the need to realize a zero trust architecture. So what should be the realistic and uh, workable secure policy framework? And then once we have decided that, then we will probably provide an idea of guidance as to how to realize, realize those policies in terms of the various components and their interrelationships as well as the workflows. Mm -hmm. So that is the first one we are going to go through, which, as I said, because of uh, Bates presenting a very graphical uh, yeah, description we'll, of the application. Yeah, we'll very, go through real fast. Very nice. We'll go through that very fast so, so that it's not a repeat. So the cloud native applications being uh, ubiquitous uh, distribution in multiple uh, cloud locations and so on, and uh, implemented as uh, microservices, implemented as containers, and then usually a uh, uh, centralized uh, application infrastructure called service mesh, which provides uh, um, all the required application services starting from authentication, authorization, as well as uh, network connections, network monitoring, and network resilience and so on. So various features. And then this diagram you would have most probably seen in the context of the service mesh, where you do see various instances of applications. And each one of them have got a associated proxy running in the same uh, network space called the sidecar proxies. Correct. Um, and then this is uh, briefly uh, capabilities of the service mesh. Uh, it is a dedicated uh, infrastructure layer, and it has got a data plane and a control plane. The control plane is the one through which all the policies are authored and pushed into where the um, sidecar proxies are programmed uh, using the control plane APIs. And this is, by the way, the service mesh definition, the service mesh working model, some of the security model, and similar stuff that we've talked about at length uh, in 204A and B, which is our, our other set of publications that Lee and I work on. So definitely check that out for, for more in-depth on Service Mesh specifically. Yeah. And uh, so this is again uh, going through the capabilities of the Service Mesh. So what the sidecar proxies do, those uh, FIPS 142 is validated sidecar proxies are the one times, uh, that is the one that intercept all the service calls at runtime and then enforce the policies. Either they can act as PIP using their own uh, uh, logic or call an external uh, authorization Correct. Uh, engine. Yeah, and the real, the real key thing that, that I want everybody to take away from this slide is the idea that that sidecar that intercepts all the traffic into and out of the application is a universal policy enforcement point. We can use it for a bunch of different kinds of policy. When I say policy, don't just hear security. 
observability, traffic routing, and similar are also policies in addition to you know, things that we think of like authorization and authentication. So think of this sidecar as a universal policy enforcement point, and we're about to talk about how we can use it to implement quite a few ZTA principles in particular. Yeah, so these sidecar proxies, uh, as Zach said, they are policy enforcement points, and they intercept not only service-to-service -service calls, but also induce it to the various resource calls. Correct. Like you know, calling a database and so on. And then in addition, they can, you can program the various network resiliency parameters uh, in terms of uh, uh, retries and things like that. Yeah, and, the, and those, those resiliency capabilities are key because fundamentally security is a trade-off of availability and security, right? It, we're, we're always operating on a spectrum, so tools to help increase our availability and reliability help us make a better trade on that spectrum for our users while maintaining the security posture that we need for the organization. Right. So although it may be the third letter in CIA, confidentiality, <laughs> so it is quite critical. And... Uh, also, continuing with uh, the capabilities of the service mesh. Um, so how to configure that? So usually, a service mesh instance, as we call it, usually you have one instance of a service which is consisting of a control plane and a number of uh, uh, sidecar proxies and uh, ingress and egress proxies that constitutes a data plane. Uh, theoretically, you can have one uh, service mesh instance for multiple clusters, but uh, both for uh, uh, fail-safe uh, reasons as well as for performance reasons, we usually restrict it to one service instance per one cluster. Yeah, the, the real thing that we want to do here is align our failure domains. So we have a global service mesh across all of our disparate infrastructure, then when the mesh fails, you have a global failure, even though you have disparate infrastructure that hopefully is fault tolerant, right? So we want to align our failure domains with physical infrastructure as well as our software infrastructure. And so having a service mesh instance in each you know, data center, in each you know, Kubernetes cluster that we're running our applications in helps us get that right balance of availability. Right. And uh, also, uh, so that's the reason why we don't want to have all the proxies calling a single control domain. And uh, further, for uh, that's not something that is even possible for air gap free systems also. Correct, so, correct. So, so that's why when we want to take uh, a zero trust architecture to the enterprise level, so we need to have uh, multiple service mesh instances and then sitting on top of this, this one, we need to have a yeah, management plane or a global control plane. Correct. So, you know, and this could be something, this can be a piece of software that's running that coordinates the mesh instances. This could be something as simple as a CD pipeline that's being used to, to synchronize, if you're in a, you know, in a uh, infrastructure as code world, that's used to synchronize the operational you know, behavior and the policy in each instance, right? So there's a lot of latitude for how you build that management plane but we do believe that that is a critical requirement to be able to take the mesh into, into a real enterprise. Right. So actually the management plane can serve even multiple purposes. You know, apart from having, uh, pushing in a consistent policy, which is po policy that is uh, uniform across the entire organization. Uh, in addition, it can also do the other services like the, uh, like the local control plane can do namely you know, interacting with the um, identity infrastructure uh, and issuing SPIFI identities, for which also Bates gave a very nice Correct. presentation on what SPIFI is, actually. So now we come to the uh, core of our presentation, namely this all background information in terms of the, what, uh, what is the scenario regarding the application infrastructure is. Now we get down to um, the fundamental as our objective of trying to build a zero trust architecture for this application environment. Yeah. So for this, we have to look at some zero trust principles in the context of this application infrastructure, and then the enterprise zero trust architecture follows from that. So of course, this is again, Bates explained it very nicely. There is no concept of parameter anymore. So when that is, when the concept of parameter has disappeared. So all access decisions have to be made on 
ideally on context-based information on the on-per-request basis, and identity therefore plays a very important part because identity is something that is uh, agnostic to the location and so on. Right. So that we know we need the identities. And, and also the properties of identity have also been uh, gone through very well, so it must be tamper-proof and cryptographically verifiable and so on and so forth. And something like a spiffy identity satisfies all of those requirements. There are certainly other identity tokens and, and schemes that we could use there as well. Service meshes in general have centered on spiffy as the way to deliver that functionality, however. One other thing I'll just say is, you know, so we've, we've talked about how the, the perimeter is no longer the boundary. The mental model that I would like for everyone to have when they think about zero trust is that a motivated attacker is already inside your perimeter. This is actually something very timely. There's a New York Times article that came out yesterday about uh, US infrastructure in the Pacific that had been compromised by a nation state actor, right? Literally yesterday. So we know that a motivated attacker can get in the perimeter. So the game becomes mitigating what an insider can do. How can we bound an attacker in space and in time? So that's the mental model that I want you to think through. And all of these capabilities give us tools to help bound the attacker. Yeah, now that... Uh we have seen what is the zero trust principles in the context of these current application infrastructure scenario. And uh, we will proceed to what is known as a zero trust architecture. So where zero trust architecture is nothing but uh, a set of components that actually utilizes those principles. And then it consists, it defines what is the interrelationship between those components and then the workflows uh, using those components. And then, of course, but last but not the least is uh, how to you know, define access policies and then how to enforce them, the policy enforcement points. And then all this should be at the you know, enterprise level. So having seen this scenario, so we have you know, come to the conclusion that you know, it is not enough to define policies only using network parameters. So we need uh, something uh, more than that. So in other words, the policy should be at multiple levels rather than only at the network parameter level. And that's what we practically found. So we right. you know, add to that. Yep, yeah. no, that, that's exactly it. So we'll, and we'll talk about what we mean when we talk about multi-tier policies in a second. Right. Just to pick up the pace a little bit because we're short on time. Oh, Any okay. Questions? Okay, so we have found that in terms of the policy choices, we need multi-level policies, network level policies, as well as identity-based policies. Yeah, and there's a couple reasons for that. So one, uh, you know, we want a defense in depth. Two, you know, identity-based policies uh, solely are not gonna fly with any auditor or, regula or regulator yet. So part of what we wanna do with 207A is move the ball for auditors, for regulators in their understanding. And so we'll talk about in the next slides about multi-tier policies and the general idea that we can start to relax some of the network tier policies, some of our perimeter controls, in exchange for better policy at the identity layer, and the net result is a same or better security posture than you had before, while gaining agility, because identity-based policy we can edit and change much more confidently and much more quickly compared to you know, old school firewall rules. What's that CIDR? What application lives in that CIDR? What's the, who's the owner for it, right? It's very hard. Identity-based policy, easier to grok, faster to change, so we can get agility. We can't do it solely today because of the state of, of compliance, therefore we need to live in this multi-tiered world, and we'll, in the next couple of slides, introduce some ways, some ideas for how we can relax network policy in exchange for, for identity policy. So, in other words, uh, as Zach said, multi-tier policies are helpful in more than one way, Apart from providing the defense in depth, it also addresses the deficiencies in each of the other two policies by themselves, and then collectively they are able to provide the level of assurance that we require. Correct. So, yeah, let's keep going. Yeah. and then so some, uh, uh, some examples of what those really multi-tier policies are. Now, in terms of the network policies, uh, you can have coarse-grained policies that are defined at the firewall, which uh, actually stipulate uh, what gateway can talk to another gateway. Yeah. So at the gateway level policies, and then you, you can have fine-grained policies that uh, define 
uh, what application subnet can talk to all the um, proxy subnet. Yeah, and, and things like micro-segmentation, right? So coarse grain, things like firewall rules, micro-segmentation on the inside gets us more fine-grained. And identity-based policy gets us the most fine-grained. And we'll introduce in the next slide or two uh, this notion of identity-based segmentation, which is one of the biggest takeaways that I would like for you to have from this presentation. <laughs> um, so just to give a practical example of uh, one of the ways that we can relax network policy and augment it with identity-based policy, uh, it's super typical. Uh, everybody has, you know, we have like a DMZ, we have firewalls. If we want to get between two sites in our company, we need to traverse that set of firewalls and that, that DMC, right? Whether that's two on-prem data centers, whether that's an on-prem and in-cloud, whatever the case is. One of the patterns that, that we have started to see is using identity-aware gateways on either side. And instead of when we have an app on-prem that wants to consume something in cloud, needing to update perimeter firewall rules pairwise, every new app needs a new rule to talk to a new SaaS, we can instead deploy these identity-aware proxies on either side. We can instantiate a single set of firewall rules that say that the proxies are allowed to talk. That's static, it doesn't change regardless of consumption. Then we can introduce identity-based policy that says this service can talk out or that service can't, right? And in that way, we can achieve significant agility in an, in, in an organization because, again, we can, cha we can change identity-based policies much more confidently and those traditional network policies that take you know, six, eight weeks to change and a, and a ticket gets filed, and they, we can sidestep or bypass. And again, we're not materially worsening our, our uh, security posture as a result. And I would argue, actually, you may even be in a better security posture than you were before. So you know, all this, we must remember in mind that uh, the network level policies have got their own limitations, especially with the current workloads like VMs and containers which are continuously migrated to Correct. the various uh, nodes. Correct. So, so any network-based policies governing, uh, depending upon their location, the nodes will not work anymore. Correct, correct. And that's why the, the high dynamism, let's go ahead to the next one. The, the dynamism of modern cloud environments is one of the reasons that traditional perimeter controls don't, aren't effective. Things are moving, things are dynamic, things are being placed. It's not really possible to, to update policy that quickly with traditional network tools. So if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, I, I want it to be these five things, these one through five there, please. So this is the concrete definition of zero trust at runtime that, that we uh, wanted to create with 207A. And we argue that at minimum, you want to do these five policy checks, encryption in transit, service auth in, service authentication, service authorization, end user authentication and end user authorization at every single hop in our infrastructure. We argue if you are doing that, then you achieve that zero trust principle of least privilege, context-based authorization with strong cryptographically verifiable identities. The service mesh can be used to help implement those capabilities. You can obviously, we can implement them in a ton of different ways. You, you can implement them independent of the service mesh as well, that's fine. Using the service mesh, though, is a very easy way to, to get these capabilities. So in particular, out of the box, the mesh will provide encryption through mutual TLS based on a spiffy identity. That same spiffy identity is then used for service authentication. And then using that authenticated principle, we can do authorization of service-to-service -service access. So already, out of the box, the mesh is doing the first three provided you write the policies that govern authorization. Then we can integrate with existing uh, identity providers and existing user to resource authorization systems that, that likely already exist in your organization to do the end user authentication and authorization as well. And again, you know, we argue this is a minimum set of policies that you should do. You know, I haven't mentioned things like, uh, like uh, WAF, protection. I haven't mentioned things like request validation. There's, there's a ton of other policy that you likely want to use in addition. But at minimum, we argue if you do these five things, you are in a, a zero trust architecture and you can then move forward from there. Yeah, some of the things that provide the security assurance in these cases is that the service or workload identity is of again, a very short duration. Yeah. And similarly, the, the tokens are also you know, dynamically generated. And Correct. 
It's and there are short, short duration. So, so as uh, we have already uh, talked about the advantages of identity-tier and multi-tier policies, we will just uh, rehashing one of them is, uh, as you know, that since it is based on identity, you know, it can be written once and uh, enforced anywhere, and it is not depending upon a particular domain and so on. And then it consists of human-readable primitives. And then, the best of all, you can actually test it without exactly recreating uh, the infrastructure as in production because it is between the applications based upon their identities and not based upon the network permit parameters. Yeah, and again, this is another reason that we can have a higher confidence and a higher rate of change of identity-based policy because we can actually do things like test it without a real network that emulates production, for example. So, in other words, uh, the, this is to emphasize that uh, these policies do not conflict. They, in fact, they build upon each other and then provides a difference in depth, this one, which this one. And more important, they act as a, some sort of a security kernel where uh, being a sidecar proxy, it's always invoked and verifiable and so on. Cannot Correct. be bypassed. So. Yeah, and this is, this is one of the big reasons that like the folks at NIST that I work with were so excited about the mesh initially, right? It helps us realize that reference monitor, that security kernel architecture of the 70s, in a modern distributed system with the same kind of guarantees and promises that we had when we were doing things like with an operating system kernel, right? We, security's not in the application, we delegate it down to that security kernel. In the distributed system, we want to delegate it down to, to the mesh, which can be that kernel. Right, as uh, Zach already said, it doesn't interfere with uh, other techniques like micro segmentation, and also it uh, allows for relaxation of the network policies in order to so that they can be addressed at a higher level through identity tier policies. Let's go fast. Keep going mm -hmm. next. Um, so then, uh, well, what do we do with this uh, policy framework? Now we come up with this enterprise level multi tier policies, and then uh, we use uh, the global uh, uh, control plane or the management plane, what we call a central coordination infrastructure to be product neutral. So we use the term to define all the policies, actually to author all the policies. So, so then this is just a framework of how the various policies interfere. In, uh, in fact, the gateways act as a bridge between the network level policies and the identity tier policies. So although all the user traffic, we know that it has to traverse through the various yeah. network controls yep. to reach. Uh, let's actually probably, we'll not spend too much time here because I want to get at least one or two questions in. You know, the short story is on the, the you know, we looked at the gateways across the DMZ. Uh, if we zoom into the right or the left side of that, there's a lot more infrastructure that we might want to deploy that would be managed by the central coordination infrastructure to facilitate a ZTA. That includes the gateways that we talked about with the, the static uh, firewall policy, but additionally that might include things like egress controls, uh, as well as service mesh sidecars to do things like encryption and transit, uh, be that universal policy enforcement point. So, uh, yeah, the, the main thing is to emphasize that using this uh, coordinated infrastructure, we are able to push a consistent set of policies, whether it is uh, ingress proxy, egress proxy, or Correct. any transit proxy. Correct. So I think we might have time for like one or two questions. We have about a minute and a half left. Uh, are there any for us, Josh? Oh, beautiful. Yeah, so uh, how, does, how does the ZTA, no perimeter stuff, you know, uh, jive with uh, the requirement for a perimeter from things like FedRAMP? Uh, that's exactly why we're writing 207A, is to help move the ball. Right, so this is leading edge, and you know programs like FedRAMP and similar uh, might eventually start to adopt these things. Uh, but first, we need to give them the space and the justification to be able to do that. So what I hope to see over time uh, is that we start to relax or augment some of these these requirements, uh, like the perimeter requirements in FedRAMP, in exchange for these identity-based policies as auditors and regulators become you know better educated in this space. Um, okay, what about the, the uh, overheads with the sidecar pattern? Um, so yes, there, there are you know, things like minimizing the configuration to a given sidecar, minimizing the policy to a sidecar, uh, good configuration of the sidecar deployment itself that can help mitigate resource usage there. 
The other thing I would suggest is you need to look at the, the actual just cost of what it is that the thing is doing. So there's a cost to doing encryption in transit. You're gonna pay that cost regardless of if it's the sidecar that performs it or it's the, the application that performs it. So some of these costs are constant, some of them are attributable to the sidecar, good configuration can help mitigate, and there's more advanced patterns that are coming down the line like uh, ambient, like Istio's ambient mode and similar to help with resource utilization. With that, I think we're out of time. Do we have one more? Beautiful. Uh, data security uh, requirements. Um, so a couple, of, so let me split this into two questions. So one is, you know, what about insider threat detection uh, and protection? Uh, the service mesh policy can certainly be used to mitigate access and can be used in reaction to an event to help cut off access. So that's one side of, of that. But in general, we wanna use the data and the telemetry that is produced by the mesh to feed our existing threat detection uh, systems. And you know, we might then close the loop by implementing uh, some functionality in those threat detection systems to use the mesh to, to enact uh, policy. And today, that's not largely done. But what we see is use it as a signal out, and then a human uh, closes the loop by enacting a policy change maybe using the mesh, maybe using a, a network policy, maybe using something else to, to limit that access. So the final goal is to use the telemetric data automatically to do the Correct. correction. Yeah. And also to address the drift issues. Correct. Uh, then real quick to touch on the encryption, data, uh, uh, data at rest still needs to be encrypted in the same way. We can offload application, encryption from the application to the sidecar, though, for encryption and transit. Uh, that's one of the big use cases. You know, for example, if we have a FIPS compliant build of Envoy and we offload encryption to Envoy, we can use that to get our, the, to meet, for example, FedRAMP encryption, uh, encryption and transit requirements without having to go change our applications, without having, to integrate, having every team integrate with PKI, you know, get the right libraries that are, that are uh, you know, approved and verified for FIPS encryption and the right configuration, all that. Instead, we can offload it to the platform, do it once, it works for, co for commercial off-the-shelf software, it works for stuff that we've built, uh, and we can manage it centrally in one place without having to go to every individual team. Alrighty, awesome. Thank you all. Uh, this was great. Hopefully this was valuable. Uh, feel free to find us and ask questions after. Thanks.